Hello friends, hello and welcome uh, to NRSMI Weekend Show. Uh, you're listening to uh, NRSMI Public Radio, live from Los Angeles. Uh, week after week, we strive to bring in people who are uh, change makers, innovators, and uh, people who are working on uh, many different social causes. Also some untold stories, unheard voices, and honest perspectives as well. So this week is no exception. We have uh, yet another incredible guest live with us from Mumbai, Kabir Chadda. A Stanford graduate earlier dumped his job as a consultant from uh, McKinsey and Company, New York, uh, to return back to India and do something useful. So he is using his innovative business ideas uh, to help take care of the elderly and old people uh, desperately in need of uh, companionship and help. So in an era where uh, nuclear families is a common phenomenon and uh, kids staying away from elderly parents due to nature of work and many, many different reasons. Uh, Kabir's business initiative seems very refreshing. So, uh, Kabir, uh, welcome to NRS Samai. Uh, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, really a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, for Kabir. Uh, and uh, just to remind our friends uh, around the world, uh, if you're in U.S. and wish to talk to Kabir, call us on 323-410-0162. And anywhere else in the world, try our uh, Skype ID, NRI Samai, NRI. S A M A Y. Uh, so, as most of you are already aware, that Skype call is absolutely free. You can call from anywhere in the world. So, even before uh, we start this interview, Kabir, uh, let me play an interesting clip uh, that you have shared with us, and thank you very much for sharing. So, let's listen to this elderly people uh, talking about the topic of uh, uh, the arranged marriages versus uh, love marriage. I, I, I really love this, uh, you know, the audio clip. I'll play a little bit. Uh, just to get a sense of what kind of uh, people we are talking about today, uh, uh, Kabir, just uh, listen to this wonderful uh, uh, conversation. Sure. Here. You may think I'm old-fashioned, but I think arranged marriages were better. These days, love marriages are better. Love marriages are better. <laughs> Both marriages are good and bad. A love marriage can go haywire and arranged marriage. I would say arranged marriage. Why I say this is that parents have an experience and they are better judge of character. It should be love marriage with the consent of the parents. They are capable of choosing their life partner. At least parents are not so Kabir, uh, just just listening to that, it sounds really awesome uh, to hear these elderly people, uh, you know, very refreshing, thoughtful, they're knowledgeable, they believe in their own ideas, a whole wide range of mindsets when you listen to each one of them. Of course, uh, it's, it's a very small clip, but uh, uh, I, I suppose you're dealing with the most mature people of our country. So now, and also on the other side of it is most of the youngsters these days think, less about elders, might, might be because of very, various different reasons and uh, they tend to spend less time, uh, spend very less time uh, with, with their parents. So how does it feel Kabir for you as a youngster working with these incredible elder people? Uh, great question, you know it's very, it's very very enjoyable on the one hand and it's very humbling on the other. Uh, you know most of the people that we work with and meet on a day-to-day -day basis have so much experience, so many stories to share, have gone through so many happy memories as well as hardships that it's quite, uh, it, it, you know, I wouldn't be doing anything else. I really, really enjoy every day uh, of my work. In fact, you know, I am just coming, I'm very glad that I made it here in time. I'm just coming from meeting one of our clients. I'm in Bombay right now and he's an 87-year-old man who worked with the government all his life and after retirement continued to serve uh, his country through doing all sorts of different projects and uh, even though right now he's going through some very tough times he suffers from Parkinson's and he has slight dementia and he uh, you know has a little bit of mobility issues he's still trying to live as active of a life as possible with the help of his children who live with him um, and he had so many interesting and wonderful stories to share that I almost lost track of time. Ah, I know you had a uh, 
hectic schedule today. I was talking to you this morning. I, I, I can really imagine uh, the kind of people you're meeting and the kind of work uh, that that you work uh, that you're really doing on ground. So uh, incredible, uh, Kabir. Was, it's, it's really fascinating when I read about your story. It's like you had wonderful schooling, work for a great company, and uh, now working with elders and old people. You know, you know, this is kind of social entrepreneurship. That's 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 the good part of it. And we at NRI Samai uh, had interviewed uh, uh, Harish Hande, a Raman Maxis Award winner, uh, who started a social uh, uh, enterprise like Selco. It's like giving uh, rural India the solar power. And also we talked to Ashwin Mahesh, uh, who started a social enterprise like Map Unity, which which uh, works yep. on uh, traffic issues in Bangalore and many. But it's 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 a social enterprise. So my question is, what kind of different do you, difference do you see in life, like being in a good company and then now coming back, working with elders? What's the big difference you see in life? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question again. Uh, you know, the biggest difference is that uh, I get to see the change that we make on a person-to-person -person basis. You know, and that's, that's what's really exciting. Uh, as you mentioned, I used to work as a management consultant with McKinsey & Company. I worked there for almost five years in New York. Um, and I really love my job and I would rec recommend it to any and everyone. What I learned was invaluable um, and uh, you know, it really set me up uh, to do what I'm doing right now. However, uh, you know, the, the impact that you see uh, at a place you know, when you're doing a consulting job, for instance, is delayed, right? You do a project, you, then you have to do the analysis, you, you know, have to come up with your recommendations and then you work with the, the team and the clients to implement them and they take you know, sometimes months, years, uh, even many years to see the returns. But uh, you know, when you have an elderly person who is lonely or an elderly person who uh, you know, is suffering from uh, you know, any kind of uh, mobility issues or ailments um, and you come into their lives and you provide some very basic yet uh, you know, good-hearted care and support, the impact is immediate. You know, the face lights up with a smile and you've done your job. Um, and so the, that's the main difference, I would say. Absolutely. And also tell us something. Uh, so this is a great idea, you know. Uh, uh, you have kinder care for, for, yeah, for small kids, toddlers, and, and every phase of life there's someone uh, to care for that particular uh, uh, age group of people right so this this tell me tell me tell us a little bit about the background and the idea behind epoch elderly care that uh, you have started Kabir sure I will um, but she got that to warn you you'll have to cut me off okay this is a long-winded spiel that I'm about to give you <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically uh, epoch elder care was based on five insights all right um, insight number one was that India has a hundred million people today above the age of 65 and that number is going to grow to 200 million in 2040. Oh. Now as a percentage of the population it's actually very small it's less than 10 percent however it is in absolute figures the world's second largest elderly population second to China mm -hmm. and so uh, the learning is, is that it's a huge problem a huge issue that we have to tackle mm -hmm. that is very easy to sweep under the rug because everyone talks about India as a young country right okay that's one second insight is that we talked with many elderly people before we launched this organization and overwhelmingly the primary need I strongly believe that an elderly person has regardless of their situation is one of loneliness requiring companionship and uh, you know you can argue that they have all sorts of other needs like medical needs, financial needs, security needs, etc. But all of those, in my opinion, are secondary to an emotional connection with somebody, an intellectual stimulation during the day, and something to look forward to. The third insight was that, unlike the West, unlike you know other developed countries like Japan or Korea or UK, uh, US obviously the big difference in India is that the elderly do not want to leave their families homes and move into a retirement facility a senior living home or old age homes as they call it in India uh, they don't want to do this because there's a very big stigma 
against it in society. What would it say about your son or your family that they couldn't take care of you in their own homes, you know? Mm. Um, and so what we have is a lot of elderly folks that are sitting at home. The fourth insight is, as I'm sure many of our Indian listeners would understand, that in India there is very there's a huge shortage of talent uh, when it comes to providing quality care for the elderly. On the one hand, you have family members uh, who have to give up quite a lot to dedicate time for their mom or dad, or you have domestic help, uh, you know, which can be uh, people who have worked with you for years and years, and even if they love the elderly person, unfortunately, it's an industry that is unreliable. Uh, right. and untrained, especially, especially when it comes to technical aspects of senior care. And then the final insight is, and this is a silver lining, is that Indians are culturally programmed to want to care for their elders. And it's a beautiful thing to see, right? Um, and so, you know, I don't think uh, the average person you meet in the U.S. or anywhere else would, uh, you know, be like many of the customers that I meet because they you know, genuinely move mountains to care for their mom or dad. They bring them from their hometowns into their own homes. They give them their children's rooms so that they have some place to stay. And they even pay for their care, uh, you know, the medical bills, all sorts of other bills. Um, and uh, oftentimes they even give up their own jobs to care for mom or dad. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to see. And in fact, that's what our business is kind of based on because we really want to help these folks care for their parents at mm. times when they are unable to do so themselves. Um, and so my customer really is someone who's between the age of 40 to 60 who uh, pays us to provide love and care for their mom or dad uh, so that you know they can do an even uh, better job of loving and caring for their parents. And so that's, that's kind of what it's based on. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh when did you start this uh, Epoch Elderly Care and uh, which cities uh, is it functional right now? Uh, we started Epoch Elder Care in January of 2012 and uh, our, the first city that we were in was Delhi and so uh, we're currently operational in all of NCR so that's Delhi, Gurdaon, Noida, Faridabad, Ghaziabad and all the other little cities uh, around. Um, and we've just launched, um, in fact, this week uh, in Mumbai. Um, and so now our services are available in Mumbai as well. And over the next, I would say, five months, we plan to be in Pune, Lucknow, Calcutta, as well as Bangalore. Oh, okay. Because uh, I'm sure a lot of people are uh, definitely looking for reliable help. You you mentioned the reliability factor, right? So, and also... Uh, it seems like you've done a lot of research and uh, intense uh, uh, material that you've, you've got uh, at, at your site. So uh, I was just wondering, uh, any, any insights on, on what kind of, uh, is there uh, any government uh, involvement for all these elderly people, government doing some programs, you uh, aligning this kind of entrepreneurship with uh, the government's uh, policies or anything of that nature, uh, Kabir, in, in your... In your analysis and research, did you look into this angle when you started off? Yeah, we did, you know. Um, and it's kind of, it, it's, it's what makes this a very interesting and exciting industry to be in, but it's also uh, obviously a gaping hole and a big need. You know, as of today, there, there are barely any government regulations or mandates to provide care and health for the elderly. There are some small, um, you know, social security uh, uh, provisions, especially for people who have served in the government or in the army, um, but that's a very small percentage. But by and large, there's no social security, no equivalent of Medicare um, for an elderly person, and even the insurance coverage uh, penetration is very, very low in India. And so, you know, on the one way of looking at it is that it's a good thing that Indian children, at least some, many of them, there are exceptions, uh, care for their parents because... Uh, guess what, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to pay for their parents' care. Um, right. So they're, they're, they're very little, there's very little. I know, I know. You mentioned that uh, there's age group of, uh, the, ta the target group is between 48 and 60, if I'm right, uh, if I heard it correct. But uh, uh, so 
Well, currently, it's it's been close to one year that you started this effort. Uh, we're getting closer, of course, uh, January 2012. Uh, so, what's the what's the age group of clients that you're dealing with right now in at uh, Epoch uh, Elder Care, uh, uh, Kabir? Yep. So my youngest client is a 58-year-old lady uh -huh. who is suffering from Alzheimer's. Um, that's why she's so young. It's my client. My oldest client is a 95-year-old lady who is much smarter than I am and sharper than I am and Definitely. has a better memory than me. Um, and uh, we have everything in the middle. But I would say that the average age uh, of my clients are around 80. 80. Oh, so and uh, even, further, even further than that, I would say that about 75% of them are women and 25% of them are men. Mm -hmm. And that is because uh, women simply live longer than men do, at least today. Oh. In fact, in India, there is a, uh, you know, the average lifespan of a, of a lady is 72 years, and a man lives for 10 years less than that on average, which is really shocking. Um, yeah. Wow. So, uh, coming coming back onto. Uh onto the basics of this problem and also uh, talking about a little bit on uh, this uh, old age homes, you know, uh, from from my childhood I've been hearing about uh, this old age homes and few, uh, what, what, what's your thoughts on this old age homes and why is that uh, old age homes are not that popular in, in, a, in our country, why is, is this reliable fact? Can you throw some light on, uh, on your research or your study on these old age homes, uh, Kabir? Sure, I would love to. Uh, but before I do, I want to caveat that what I'm about to say is more relevant to North India, to the Delhi area. Um, uh, you know, the south of India is quite enlightened when it comes to aging properly and aging well, and they're much, much more ahead of the curve. Um, so I would like to put that out there. Oh, okay. um, however, the, the situation in North India is quite dismal. Um, Basically, it's very simple, you know, uh, even in the Delhi area, there are hundreds of old age homes that exist, but uh, the average old age home has anywhere between 10 to 20 beds or uh, inmates, as they call them, um, and, uh, you know, most of them are either government run or NGO run, and their target segments are the destitute, the poor elderly people who cannot afford to provide basic food and shelter for themselves. Okay, mm -hmm. and so they are doing wonderful and tremendous work. However, if you are a middle class family or higher, you know, you don't want to leave your mom and dad in a home like that. That's very simple. And so obviously it reinforces the stigma, uh, you know, that how could you leave your parents in a home like this, right? right? So that's one element of it. That supply of good privately run old age homes that are affordable is pretty pretty, pretty low, near zero. However, there are players that are coming into the market and doing that. Um, but it's, you know, 10-year horizon for sure. Right. The second issue is in the family itself. You know, even if I today was to build a wonderful old age home, right, that was both affordable and really, really well run, like a four-star or five-star hotel, I would still have trouble convincing people to move into it. Why? Because, uh, you know, the Indian tradition and the Indian culture is such that the son of the family is expected, not only by his parents, but by his peers and by society, to provide for his parents when they grow old, right? Oh, okay. So, many, and, and I see this on a day-to-day -day basis with my clients, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't really grow up in India. I moved out of India when I was 10 years old. And so sometimes, uh, you know, even I'm surprised by how traditional, uh, you know, families can be. But, uh, you know, the expectation is definitely on the sun. So I'll give you an example. You know, for example, uh, there's this client of mine uh, and there are many, many clients of mine who are ladies who have to live with their daughters as opposed to their sons. And they're very, very vocally uncomfortable about that because they feel uncomfortable that they are living in their son-in-law's home. Uh, you know, and so there are definitely very strong uh, family and traditional values that govern how elderly people view living at home to begin with, and moving out of a home is just completely out of the question. Uh, you know, another example I'll give you is uh, a friend of mine um, runs a small company that is trying to get into old age homes and retirement living in India, and he told me about uh, this elderly couple who 
who wanted to move to an old age home. They were ready to take the plunge. They wanted to sell off their home in the hot cars in Delhi um, and move to you know an old age home. However, what ended up happening was that their son found out and then he stopped them. Mm. He stopped them because he said, Dad, what would my friend say if you moved into a retirement community? Oh. I don't, you know, don't worry, stay at home. I don't see what's wrong. I will, you know, I will come and I'll do whatever I can to make your life great. Mm -hmm. But you are not moving to an old age home. So, you know, that's oh. the other problem. Right, right. Wow. Mm. Excellent, uh, excellent thoughts uh, there, Kabir. And uh, I'm trying to understand this. What kind of help are these uh, uh, are uh, are elderly people looking out for? Generally, in 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 general, what kind of help are these elderly people looking out for in general? You know, uh, most of them that I've come across are looking for companionship. Okay. Oh. Uh, and uh, the, the biggest issue, as you know, as you mentioned earlier in your introduction, that uh, really plagues uh, an elderly person's quality of life is loneliness. Right. Um, and and uh, that's that's really what one has to tackle. And there are many ways of doing it. You know, obviously the family plays a big role. Uh, you know, making sure that you're you're um, engaging the elderly person that's living with you or if they're living by themselves and visiting them frequently and often, calling them often. Um, the other thing that's important is when a family member calls an elderly person, you know, to make sure that you're not just focusing on the basic needs, uh, like, you know, checking if, uh, Dad, have you had your medicines? Have you eaten your food? Have you made sure to take a walk today? Okay, okay, bye. Right? That's the um, average call. Yes. But... Uh, you know, dad doesn't really care about if he's taken his medicines or had his food. What he wants to know is more details about your day. Tell him a story, you know. Um, uh, talk to him about something that he wants to talk about. And that's something that uh, oftentimes gets neglected. So that's, you know, one way of doing it. Uh, another thing that's very important is to keep social interactions alive outside of the immediate family, right? right. Um, so people that are their friends uh, or in their friend circle or if they have... Uh, you know, uh, relocated or moved to a new place and they don't have that many friends and making sure that you force them to go and make some friends, uh, you know, of all ages, um, either outside of the home or if they have mobility issues and, you know, get people to the home. That's very, very important and it keeps them engaged and active and gives them something to look forward to. Uh, you know, when I, uh, you know, when I age, I really, really wish and hope that I am, you know, constantly engaged with new people um, as well as people that I know really well uh, because that that's really what the biggest problem the people I meet face. Oh, okay, okay. So, what kind of services does your uh, company, uh, Epoch Elderly Care, uh, Elder Care, sorry, uh, offer? So we we provide three services, mm -hmm. um, but the the way that we do it is that we recruit people that are between the ages of twenty five and thirty five. Okay? okay, and they all have master's degrees or more in psychology, occupational therapy, and other health adjacent fields. And their job is to primarily be a companion and a friend to the elderly person that they are working with. By the way, they are, uh, you know, selected for not only their hard skills and work experience with the elderly, but most importantly, their soft skills. So their empathy, their creativity, their patience, as well as their persistence to gain the elderly person's trust. Mm -hmm. And through the relationship that they build, we do three things. One is intellectual companionship activities. Two is health services. And three is Alzheimer's and dementia care. And I'll talk about all three of them in a second. Mm -hmm. But I should say that all of this happens in a home care model. It means that I don't have any property. I don't own an old age home. I send somebody to come to your home to spend time with your elderly person. And if they're mobile and if they're active, then we spend a good amount of time going on outings and social visits as well. So let me talk about each one of those elements. You know. sure. The first thing is intellectual companionship. Um, and that's really the crux of what we do. You know, this is basically spending time talking to each other, listening to each other's stories, uh, getting the elderly person to discuss current events and news items, playing games that they are fond of, 
rediscovering hobbies like knitting and art and music once again, even in their old age, and assisting them with them if they have any kind of disabilities that you know stops them from being able to paint or knit. Uh, and also it includes going on outings, so going for a shopping trip to buy a card for their grandchild, or uh, you know going to see a movie, or going out to get a cup of coffee. Um, you know that's really what intellectual companionship is all about. In fact, one of my clients who used to be a voracious chef uh, back in her day, uh, you know, has revived that uh, hobby of hers, and now every week my elder care specialist and her make one of the old old dishes that she used to make, and they write down the recipe. They take photographs of it, and they they blog about it online, wow. and it's a great way for her family members all around the world to follow it, except now there are some very uh, interesting food critics that are also starting to follow this elderly lady's blog, uh, which is quite, quite funny. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of things that we do that are intellectual companionship oriented, and we try to refresh it every week and come up with new and interesting things that will keep the elderly person engaged, active, and happy. So that's one. Right. Second is health services. So what we do there is non-medical health services. Um, this includes doing vital sign checking, so we check the blood pressure, the blood sugar, temperature, weight, etc., and we record it. Mm -hmm. We also do hygiene checks to make sure that personal hygiene as well as environmental hygiene levels are adequate, and we take action if they're not. Mm -hmm. We book and calendar doctor and specialist appointments as well as accompany the elderly person to go to the hospital if there's no one else to go with them. And uh, we also generally make sure that the elderly person is comfortable and healthy. Uh, you know, and so that's the health services aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then we also do Alzheimer's and dementia care for any of our clients who have Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. Oh, okay. And in that case, in that case, uh, you know, we double down and focus a lot on companionship because that becomes very important. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also provide memory care as well as caregiver respite. Um, and memory care is really when we perform cognitive activities and cognitive stimulation to make sure that the elderly person's brain is continued to be exercised and that their uh, you know, thinking abilities do not degenerate as fast as they would otherwise. Um, and caregiver respite is really all about um, giving the caregiver a break so that they can go and live their own life for an hour or two or three in a day so that and for those few hours we take over. Oh, okay. So that's really what our service is all about. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I think you're covering the entire uh, uh, idea of uh, the companionship and uh, looks like uh, you're, t you're talking about intellectual companionship and also health uh, related uh, aspects that you take care at your site. Seems incredible. So what can you share some experiences of few elderly people that you're dealing with? Uh, just just talk about uh, an example of, of a client and what kind of issues he is uh, dwelling with on a daily basis and how Epoch Elderly Care is stepping up and helping uh, the client. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe I can take two examples. Sure, I'll give please. you an example of a companionship client mm -hmm. and then I'll give you an example of a dementia client. That would be great. Okay. Uh, which are two very, very different things. And I want to make the distinction because, uh, you know, I want to uh, make sure that our viewers, under our viewers, our listeners understand that, uh, you know, uh, even a person who is exceptionally healthy and well uh, can really benefit from our services. And so I just want to make that clear. It doesn't have to be that they have some sort of dementia or something like that. So, um, uh, you know, uh, our companionship client, one person that comes to mind immediately is uh, this lady who lives in Bogao. She's about 84 years old, and uh, you know she's a very sweet and charming, wonderful lady. She um, didn't really work in her prior, uh, you know, years. Um, she used to um, originally be near the Mumbai area. That's where she was from. But now she's moved in with a daughter in Bogao, and uh, she loves to cook. She loves to, uh, you know, do household activities. She needs to be, uh, you know, in charge of the home because that's where her identity really is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she also has uh, a few American grandchildren, okay, okay. Um, who, who are fairly young. I won't go into the math of the ages. 
but they are born and brought up in the U.S. and they come to visit her every now and then. Except the thing is that they're growing older, and so uh, you know one of the things that we've talked about is that she's starting to learn English to make sure that she continues to keep up with her grandchildren who live abroad, right? So that they know that they have time to spend with their nanny. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, in in her case, uh, what does happen is that her all her children are living away from her and she lives alone. Um, and uh, she has some family members living with her, but they are, uh, you know, her immediate children are living alone. And in her case, basically, the elder care specialist goes and makes sure that they have a strong bond with her, and they motivate her and make sure that everything is fine and good. Uh, and they inform, uh, you know, the rest of the children, where, wherever they're living around the world, that, listen, there's no need to worry. Everything is hunky dory Everything is great. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, you know, they uh, have started going on outings once a week, which is really exciting for her. It really makes, uh, you know, a mark on her week. They go and discover shops and new myths. They do a lot of the shopping um, and make wish lists of things she would like. Uh, you know, and every now and then her children might surprise her with one of those. Mm -hmm. um, they also go uh, and make a lot of holiday cards. Um, and uh, she loves to cook and loves to make sweets and mithais. So, um, you know, we make, an, uh, make a practice out of it to make sure that she uh, creates packages and parcels that she can surprise her children with. So that's wonderful. Um, we also do a lot of uh, analytical thinking and reading uh, with the news. And so every week, uh, you know, we dedicate one session to talking about, uh, you know, what is a major news event that has happened and let's talk about it, understand that what are the different aspects, what do different people think about what's going on, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they also love to play memory games and stimulating games uh, because it's important to have a mix of activities that, uh, you know, we want to do with her and have her do activities that she wants to do. You know, so she really loves to do, um, you know, play Scrabble. One of the games that she loves is Taboo, which some of our American uh, uh, listeners would be very familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we do all of that as well. And so. Uh, basically, we visit her uh, three times a week for an hour and a half or so uh, each visit, um, and we also make sure to call her on the days that we don't go so that we have a daily touch with her, and uh, she loves it, and her children love it. They love getting updates on what she's up to, what she's doing, uh, and it gives them an opportunity also to pipe in and say that, hey, maybe she'd like to do this new activity or here's something that I would like to try, um, and it gives them really... Uh, in a way to you know continue to be very very involved in her care uh, and in her life, and so that's that's a companionship client. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's really sharp, really smart, and perfectly healthy. You know, she does. Oh, yeah, uh, she walks. Yeah. Sure. yeah, she walks three kilometers every evening. You know, so wow. um, so that's one. Second is you know maybe I can talk to you uh, about one of our uh, dementia clients. Um, uh, she is a lady who's originally from Calcutta and has moved into um, uh, moved to Delhi um, with her uh, daughter, mm -hmm. and basically her uh, spouse has uh, you know her partner has just passed away, and the passing of her partner really aggravated her dementia and uh, brought her quickly to a stage where she couldn't really recognize anyone, was quite aggressive. Um, very agitated, especially in the evening times, she would, uh, you know, lose uh, all orientation and be sailing about, and it was not very easy to manage her and care for her. What added to it was that the fact that she moved from Calcutta to Gurgaon, um, sorry, to Delhi, mm -hmm. um, made it such that, you know, the, the daughter who was caring for her really loved her, mm -hmm. had never cared for her before in her own home. Uh, and so she really had no clue what to do with this, uh, you know, what to do with her mother who was uh, very uh, much in an agitated state. Uh, I mean, you can read up about Alzheimer's, but you don't really know what to do when you have to provide the care for her. And so they came to us and requested our help. And basically, uh, you know, this is one of my, uh, I love the story because we really made a big impact in their lives. Um, uh, our elder care specialist goes there on every other day and ba uh, basically we constructed a schedule for her, a routine uh, throughout the entire day. So, you know, from the time where she wakes up, she, you know, bathes and brushes her teeth and wears her clothes to the time where, uh, you know, she has morning activities that we've charted out for her. She goes for, a, you know, does a little bit of morning exercises, then has lunch and then takes a routine nap 
and then uh, you know spend some time reading the newspaper and doing other things, uh, and then goes for a routine evening walk. Uh, then her family, if they have time, make sure to take her out uh, to you know either eat dinner or see a movie at least once or twice a week, and then she goes back to bed. And the only addition to this is that on uh, you know every other day uh, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. we make sure to send our elder care specialist so that she knows uh, you know that uh, epoch elder care person is coming to spend time with her and is really looking forward to that uh, you know and the first thing that we really strive for uh, in someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia is to get to a point where if the if the elderly person can't recognize us then at least they can you know feel a sense of comfort with the elder care specialist that's visiting them right. because that's very very important Right. And then the second thing that's very important is creating a structured schedule that they can follow so that uh, you know their orientation gets better and they don't get confused as to what's going on. What we also help her do is uh, declutter her home and declutter the you know uh, the areas that the elderly lady lives in so that she gets even less confused. Um, and then uh, we also worked with the staff that come to the home. So there's a, a domestic helper who works there. Uh, and then there are two attendants who spend the entire day there. Uh, one spends 12 hours during the day and one spends 12 hours during the night. And we work with them as well as her daughter to make sure that all of them are aware of what the good schedule is and that they can all stick to it and they have uh, you know, support and assistance from us in case they don't know what to do. So that's this kind of the setup that we did, right? Oh, yeah. And then during the hour that we spend with her, uh, you know, we do all sorts of stimulating cognitive activities um, that are, you know, obviously much simpler, but uh, really help exercise her brain and help her uh, focus for for some time as well. Um, you know, and it's going really well. She's, uh, you know, the trauma that uh, her partner's passing caused her has uh, gone down quite significantly and her signs of dementia are also reducing um, from that time. Oh. Obviously it's important to say that Alzheimer's and dementia is something that is and definitely a degenerative thing and right. so what we try to do is we try to delay the onset as much as possible by doing uh, you know activities and so on. Incredible uh, Kabir, this is, this is incredible stuff you know. Uh, I was wondering uh, the uh, dealing with the kind of uh, wide variety of people that you're you're dealing with, and uh, you definitely need people, uh, some uh, some very uh, very good, uh, uh, compassionate people to deal with uh, these clients, right? So, wh what what's your uh, uh, recruitment style? How do you hire these people who are working with these clients? What's the background you look for? <coughs> Great question. Um, you know, if, if anyone's listening uh, and wants to work with us, you better listen up uh, because we love what we do and if you do too, then we want you to be with us. But basically, the way that we, we are very, very selective, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so for every one person that we hire, we get around 200 resumes. Um, okay. we've, done the, we've done the analysis. But basically, we look at the resumes and I'll walk you through the process. We screen them for people who have uh, education and work experience in a, you know, uh, related fields. Mm -hmm. So people who have master's degrees or more who are living in India in the cities that we work in or are willing to go there and have um, you know done philosophy, uh, sorry, done psychology, occupational therapy, sometimes physiotherapy uh, as well. So that's the bare minimum that we look for. And then in addition to that, you know, uh, we give a high preference to people who have work experience with the elderly, either in a personal or a professional sense. So, for example, we have a gentleman working with us who worked in Australia for a retirement community there. He's an Indian and he wanted to come back to India and work, uh, you know, for the elderly in India. And so he was a great addition to our team. We also have a lady who works with us who, uh, you know, was a primary caregiver for her grandmother when she had Alzheimer's for the last five years of her life. Um, and she also happens to be an MBA in healthcare management as well. Mm. And so she is a great addition to our team also. Um, and then, you know, once we go through the resumes, we, we filter them down and interview about 20 or 30 of them after phone screening and all of that. And the interview process is a very rigorous one where, uh, you know, we do three kinds of interviews. One is an interview that tests the person's hard as well as soft skills. Um, so, you know, we ask questions that, 
uh, really out of um, the ordinary that assess the person's uh, ability to show empathy, creativity, uh, good judgment, uh, patience, and a real desire to work with the elderly. Um, you know, for example, one of the questions that we ask in an interview, I'll have to delete it now that I'm saying it in public, um, but one of the questions that we ask is, uh, you know, let's say that you're meeting an elderly person for the first time and, uh, you know, their partner has just recently passed away, their husband or their wife, right, which happens very commonly. Yes, yes. What would you say to the elderly person about that in your first meeting? And we ask that, you know, to the interviewee candidate. And a lot of people falter, they don't know what to do, they have, you know, very awkward uh, responses and answers, but every now and then you find a gem of a person who's really empathetic and, you know, the true feelings come through. And those are the kind of people we're looking for, right? So that's the first kind of interview that we do. Then we also do a simulation interview where we put them in front of a client, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, you know, a 50-year-old lady whose mom you'll be working with. And that client grills them and asks them, you know, why should I let you work with my mom? Why, you know, uh, in this situation, what would you do? In that situation, what would you do? Um, and uh, we see, you know, how that person reacts um, uh, when, not only when they're dealing with the elderly, but when they're dealing with the elderly's family members, which is also very important for right. us to do. Uh, and then finally, uh, we also do a simulation with them and an elderly person. And this really is for us to see, you know, uh, is this person able to engage an elderly person for, uh, you know, an hour and we observe them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end, we consult the elderly person to ask them what they thought of them. You know, would they, you think this person would make a good elder care specialist? Would you be excited to see them again? Um, and we really heavily weight that because what do we know? You know, we are young people. Yes. Uh, we're really looking for people who are like my old people. Right. Um, so anyway, so that's, uh, there's no magic in it, um, but it's a very rigorous process. Uh, that has so far uh, given us incredible elder care specialists. I know absolutely because this is 360 degrees kind of an interview, right? You do you do interviews with these guys who are showing interest and uh, who genuinely want to help, and also you're taking the, uh, the the feedback from the client, asking them how did they feel about this person. So that that's the first step in in, in jiving these these kind of people to the elderly uh, people as well. So I think that that's a good uh, uh, approach that uh, you're following. Uh, incredible. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. And you know, in fact, what's really funny is that um, one uh, one thing is that you know we recruit our elderly to do work with us, work uh -huh. for us rather, right? So, so like uh, if you're a client and you happen to be there and you happen to be healthy and you know have a few hours to kill, then uh, we say that hey, you know, uncle, why don't you be our interviewer for the day? We uh -huh. need some. We need you for a few hours. And so they are more than happy to do it. You know, they love it. And uh, there's nothing better than giving uh, you know an elderly person a job. Absolutely. Um, that, that's the most satisfying. You, you know, when in, in, in the social entrepreneurship world, it's a new era of social entrepreneurship, right? And then uh, these incredible ideas really count. This, they really matter and they really serve these people who, are, who genuinely are looking out for uh, help, right? So I think this is one, one great idea, uh, asking elderly people to interview. They, they, they know the wavelength, they know the frequency, they, they, they understand what uh, elderly people really need. So great thoughts on that side as well. And also, uh, let's talk about this affordability factor. You know, uh, this kind of uh, uh, work, it is definitely not easy, it's intense. It's, uh, it's not easy to take care of a very small kid or a, uh, an elderly person. So what, what's the pricing plans that you have got, uh, Kabir? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, uh, basically the niche that we've carved out of ourselves is we work with people who uh, can afford high quality services because, uh, you know, we are, while it is a social uh, enterprise, um, you know, we want to hire people that are exceptional quality and therefore we have to pay them competitively and pay them well to keep them, uh, you know, excited about jobs like this. Um, and our charges reflect that. Um, so basically, we charge three hundred dollars a month for our services, um, and uh, we usually sign up people on a three-month basis. And then at the end of every three months, we get the customer to think about, um, you know, how their experience was. And uh, you know, in nine out of ten cases, they uh, renew. So that's you know, that's wonderful for us. Um, so that, that that's what it is. That said, you know, we are also trying to work with um, NGOs to, um, you know, we've come up with a plan of care 
for um, how we can serve the lower income population as well. Yeah, that's pretty um, but that's very, yeah. Much still, that's very much still in the planning stage. Um, however, we have done a lot of research around it, you know, so if you're interested, basically we found out that it costs um, 3,000 rupees per person per month to provide shelter mm -hmm. and food and basic hygiene for an elderly person in an old age home. That is a very, 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 very basic catering to the poor, you know the low income segments home. Okay, so oh, that's three thousand yeah. bucks a month um, uh, in dollars. I think that's uh, sixty dollars a month. Okay, uh -huh. um, so two dollars a day. Uh, yeah. oh, but what that gets you is an elderly person that's sitting on a bed that's relatively well fed, healthy, um, and clean, looking at a wall for eighteen hours a day. Uh -huh. and that's it. That's their existence. Wow. And so what we've what we've gone and done is that uh, we've done a further analysis to say that it costs an additional two thousand rupees a month. That's two dollars. That's uh, you know a dollar and a half a day um, to provide emotional connect and companionship to them as well. And we are able to provide those services. Um, so you know if uh, you know of anyone who um, is interested in uh, funding an effort like that that does cater to the low income segment, uh, we'd be more than happy to meet them. Oh, awesome! And uh, can you can you uh, tell us out on areas and on on the, on the uh, communication channels that people can reach out to if somebody is listening to the show and they wanted to talk more about this? What are the various communication channels? Uh, can you put forth uh, here, Kabir? Absolutely. So um, basically, the best way to reach us is by email. Mm -hmm. um, you can email us at info at epochelderthere dot com. That info. is I N. S O at epocheldercare.com spelled E P O C H E L D E R C A R E dot com. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, you know that uh, you can also check out our website that has all our contact information, and that's www.epocheldercare.com. Once again, that's www.e p o c h e l d e r c a r e dot com excellent excellent and also i see your facebook page and a few of these posts are really really interesting you know i think uh, uh, all these young guys or uh, people who are on facebook or uh, who are able to share information do 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 reach out to this page i, I just visited this page incredible pictures out there epoch elder care e p o c h e l d r c a r e epoch elder care then you can uh, uh, connect to them, add them as your friends, or uh, whatever be possible on the social networking side as well. So, very good. Uh, and uh, uh, any 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 final thoughts? I think we passed uh, for 40. We crossed past I think 45 minutes here. So, uh, any any other uh, message or inputs or interesting things that you want to share with listeners even before? Yeah, we sure. You know, um, I, I guess the only thing that I'd like to say is that uh, you know if you're listening to this and you know. Uh, of an elderly person, either they are your parents, or they are your aunt and uncle, or they are your grandparents, um, or you know they just happen to be your neighbor or someone that you know um, who are living in India. Then uh, you know please do uh, request their loved ones, you know their family, uh, to reach out to us, um, you know reach out to us yourselves, um, because we're really here to help and we really want to make a difference in their lives and. I cannot tell you what a difference we make in the clients that we serve, um, and uh, it's really, really rewarding not only for us but also for the families, um, you know, who bring us in. And so, do do reach out to us. Uh, that's all I would like to say. And uh, finally, thank you, Shikant, for giving us the opportunity. Uh, it's really, really, um, you know, a great, uh, great show that you have, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to me. So that's really sweet of you. Oh, thank you, Kabir. Uh, and, and, and also, we at NRS, I really believe in social entrepreneurship, something solving, uh, problem-solving kind of uh, work, uh, in turn making a, a, a big difference uh, in the community. So, Kabir, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you on our show, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. So, friends, there is Kabir Shadda, a Stanford grad earlier, dumped his job as a consultant for McKinsey & Company, New York-based company. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, and uh, he returned back to India to do something useful, and uh, he is using his innovative business ideas to help take care of the elderly and old people, 
who desperately need of companionship is brought, he brought about multiple uh, fold up uh, issues and uh, uh, and help that they offer at uh, epoch elder care you can uh, you can uh, learn more about their work at uh, epochelderCare.com, e p o c h e l d e r c a r e dot com and in an era where uh, nuclear families has become a common phenomenon and uh, kids uh, staying away from parents and uh, many different uh, factors coming into picture so Kabir's in initiative definitely definitely is, is refreshing as we had a conversation a 45 minutes conversation with him I, I'm, I'm sure you've got more insights on uh, on, on uh, old age and how uh, they can be taken care of with uh, proper uh, proper uh, uh, ideas so as kids we had uh, friends at uh, home and school and uh, that else we do we do have friends at work and uh, friends in the social uh, networking sites like Facebook of course in this new era so going by this uh, the old age uh, we, we really imagine that uh, they would have plenty of friends but unfortunately it, it seems quite opposite as uh, we sp just spoke to Kabir and so uh, day, in, uh, day in and day out uh, uh, this elderly people need support and uh, it's uh, definitely good work from uh, Epoch Elder Care so you can reach out to them through multiple folds, epochelderdaycare.com, E-P-O-C-H-E-L-D-R-C-A-R-E.com, and also reach out to them on uh, uh, via the, their email, info at epochelderdaycare.com. Also, you can connect to them through Facebook. So stay tuned, friends. Uh, tomorrow we have yet another incredible show coming up with Kalyan Akipedi. So he is working on an adequate village in uh, close to 1,000 days, which is uh, sustainable and replicatable. So uh, that sees the inhabitants directly uh, getting involved in its own thinking and its making. So how, how can somebody uh, create an adequate village in 1,000 days? It's an incredible idea. And then uh, uh, do, do come back tomorrow for, uh, for listening to Kalyan Akipedi live here on NRI Samai. Same time, 8 a.m. Pacific time, USA time, and 11 a.m. Eastern time. Also, you can, uh, uh, and friends in India, you can listen to this show at 9.30 p.m., uh, uh, the usual time on NRSMA. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Listen to this wonderful uh, music. Thank you, friends.